I did a series of year-end videos at the end of last year about various topics, one of which was gaming surprises that I had when I reflected back on my year in gaming. And in that video, I mentioned that I was surprised that I had not played Mage Knight over the course of last year. And it led me to consider why that was the case and whether Mage Knight had run its course with me. And in the context of that video and comments I received on that video, a number of people suggested to me that I look into Champions of Hara. This is by Leaf Pile Media, who sent me this copy of the game, because they said, and, and I see online when I looked up the game, because I hadn't heard of this game. When I looked up the game on BGG, many of the comments do mention that this sort of replaces Mage Knight for them or whatever. So I obtained this copy of the game, extremely curious to see exactly how people said it replaced Mage Knight or whatever. This is actually an empty box, but I want to show you the art along the sides of the box, which is really great. The art overall in this game is absolutely fabulous. And again, is another one of these few games, really, I think, in the fantasy genre that brings it out of the, what I would call just the typical fantasy type of art direction that we see in so many games into something else. And it, it becomes incredibly captivating as we look here at the back of the box, that it, it proclaims that it is for, and we'll see this in, as we as we look at the rules, co-op versus and solo style gameplay, tactical miniature combat, characters have distinct resource systems, indeed they do, modular map changes throughout the game, indeed it does, multiple character progression paths, narrative adventures through a rich world. I will say that this is a game from... 2018 and Greenbrier, Graham, Greenbrier Games, I should correct myself, from earlier is who was kind enough to send me this copy of it. I'm far from the first to do a video on this. There's tons of videos on this game. Yeah. And as I've, I've played it a bunch of times and I'm going to show it to you in a second. And this is really going to just be a discussion of my impressions of it, particularly in the context of why it was recommended to me. And um, if you're looking for more demonstration of the rules in the gameplay. As I said, there's tons of videos out there and I don't need to duplicate that. But for those of you that are interested in my impressions on games, that's what this video is going to be. These are some of the characters and their special abilities. And what I will say about this game, both in the character ability and in the monster ability, where there's like maybe five different keywords for monsters, it makes excellent use of a limited, a relatively limited number of abilities to differentiate among things that happen. And I'll show you on the monster. Uh, I'll show you on the monster here first. There are five monster keywords which alter when the monster attacks, how much damage it does, or create additional limitations or advantages. So aggressive will attack the monsters when you, the monsters will attack you when you go onto their space and they're sort of hanging out in the world. Allies, allied monsters are kind, intelligent, or opportunistic, and you can get their benefit when you go into their world. There's armored, which will have a defense. Critical are seasoned combatants. So if they attack, you can roll a die. And if you get a five or a six, then there's an additional attack. And then dangerous monsters will sort of attack you on the way out. So if you defeat them, they're going to go down fighting. This is enough to really differentiate monsters. And I'm mentioning this here at the outset because it also ties back a little bit to that other video I did where one of the things I was talking about was that I had just sort of given up on Dungeon Crawler game after making a couple videos on it, owning it, trying to play it and replay it because it just has so many keywords. And I think so many games have just a ton of differentiated keywords that one thing this game does really effectively is it gives you enough differentiation with the monster, say, with just these five different keywords that that's really all that is needed. And it's still, it still, uh, it attains the impact, which is to have differentiated play and to have something, a different type of interaction happening. And ditto with the, the characters. So we have, for example, Persephone here, who I think is my favorite character. And she she has a, a fear factor. So her she gets scared and you get the 
You get a thematic reason for this in the story about the character. Hailing from a lightless world filled with predatory horrors, Persephone hopes to win the conflicts to end her nightmares once and for all. Ha haunted by the dream of Seth's scientists called the Onari for her ability to wield fear, Persephone grows stronger in the presence of great terror, whether it is her own or her opponents. And basically, as she gets damaged, she increases in fear, and we'll see this in when we go to the table. And then the ability cards that she has, the more fear she has, or the more terrified or scared she is, the better benefits she gets. And all of the characters have their various differentiation in that way. Again, not a million things to manage, but enough that they play differently. And that is really one of the cool benefits of the game. The last thing I'll say before we take a look at the components does concern the rule book, and this is kind of a negative on the game. It is it is just not terribly well organized and you know I hate to spend a ton of time on talking about how a rule book is poor because I mean partially because I just I just don't really understand why a game can go through development and end up with a poor rule book when, you know, as I've said on numerous videos that I do on games with poor rule books, you know, it could cost a couple thousand dollars to get a professional editor to look at something and to make it work. And, you know, that that money, I think, is well spent because when games have poor rule books, you continually see that in the comments about a game. And I do think a poor rule book can influence sales in that way. But, you know, it's a kind of back end thing that doesn't show up, doesn't show up as art, it doesn't show up as components, but it is so important. And speaking of the art, again, even in the rule book here, I can't, uh, I can't avoid showing you some of the wonderful art that is even just in the rule book. And it does, it does go a lot to involve you in this game. This is game is a little bit, you know, it was mentioned, as I said, uh, in the context of Mage Knight for me, but a little, I mean, it has like a, it's a teeny bit of, I can't say it's like Runebound, but the, the Overland Adventure aspect of it is Runebound-esque, and the, the art and the art direction really is quite effective in creating the feeling of the world. And I think with that said, we'll go and we'll take a look at it on my table. It's quite a big footprint, so I had to move it elsewhere from where I typically film. All right, now having said I'm not going to explain this game because there's so many videos on it, I am going to at least give you the briefest of overview to show that you are occupying a world here and this is a modular board and indeed during the course of the world, uh, during the course of the game, world shift events will happen which will actually cause you to move some of these sections and interchange them with each other. You are, this is your character and this is Persephone who I mentioned before. This is her with her fear following her. And then this setup here, we are having a battle or a game against the corrupted one, in this case, like an overlord who is sending out mushroom spores that will impact the monsters on the board and impact you indeed to give them benefits. And you have monsters that are spawned and you have events that will occur and the events cause you to make decisions about spending some of your own assets, which are indicated here. These are energy markers and your health track and your spirit track and utilizing your spirit track to maximize a die roll to then succeed at the event or take the failure at the event. And in essence, though, there are, as I mentioned, there's a lot of scenarios in the game and there are character specific scenarios as well that utilize the individual benefits of the character. So for example, this is Persephone as mentioned, and she has this fear track which will go up and down during the course of the game as certain things happen to impact her during the course of the game. And depending on what her fear is, she will be more or less able to utilize certain cards. Card play is at the heart of this game, and I think that's probably why it was mentioned in conjunction with my comment about noticing that I had not played Mage Knight in the course of the year, because 
in this game, much like in Mage Knight, you're using cards for movement, you're using cards for combat, and in this game you'll notice that there is this in hand, and if you turn it upside down, on board for every card, and what this means is that if you have the card in hand, you can play it for this benefit, and then you place it down on your area, and the next time you want to play it, you can use it for that benefit. And that's true of all the cards in the game, including, well, I shouldn't say all the cards, because there are item cards. And item cards are interesting because they have numbers on them, and they're attached to specific monsters. So, for example, if you defeat a monster, this monster here, the Ice Phoenix, will you will gain item card number nine. And that's going to be a card that thematically relates to the monster. Let me see if I can find that card. So the Ice Phoenix is going to drop its feather, and you're going to be able to pick it up and use it. And it will allow you, if you would be defeated, to discard the card to return to your spawn value for your spawn area. So it's extremely thematic in that regard. You can see, again, from the outlay here of the tiles, how beautiful and rich, both in color and in art, the game is as we just look through some of the the some of the cards here it almost is on some level it almost feels like a little bit too much and i can see that it might even be hard to see well here's that ice phoenix that we saw um the events are just with text but a forgotten guardian and this is the health the way the combat works is there are not rounds of combat. You either have enough to defeat the monster or you don't try because you can't, it, the damage does not carry over. So if you can mount the energy to defeat it, you would, not energy in the game, but you have attack cards. If you can use enough attack to defeat it, you would. And in this case, I mentioned this has the keyword, so it's going to have some armor value and it's going to be dangerous to you. So I think dangerous means it was going to come back and do an attack to you. That's the number two value there as it goes out and you will gain various benefits. And these benefits are your energy or an item card that will allow you to, to do more things. And basically, though there are the many scenarios that I indicated for the individual characters and co-op scenarios, Honestly, they all kind of, they, 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 they boil down to sort of the same thing, which is traveling around the world, dealing with the events, dealing with the world shifts where the tiles are going to be moving during the course of the game, and also more monsters coming out. So at dusk, and it follows a day-night schedule here, which you can't really see because I had to move that going around for six days and nights. At dusk, you pull in a card, which may be another monster, or it may be some type of rift that happens where, again, you need to attempt to succeed at that rift and gain some benefits for it. And as you play the game, the board just gets more and more filled with monsters and more and more impacts that we saw in the rules, the Herald of the Worm. And if you meet it, and you know, eventually you're going to meet the win conditions or not before the game ends. What I really enjoyed about this game is the card play, which is, as I said, at the heart of it, and it is very Mage Knight esque. The difference between this and, say, something like Mage Knight is it's challenging because there's just this incredible degree of randomness when you know when you know that things could just move around. So on the one hand, you have the cards where you want to plan ahead because you see something in your hand and you know that when you use it, you'll be able to use something else with it the next turn. But on the other hand, before you get to that next turn, things are going to possibly shift. So if there's a monster somewhere within your range, and there is range in this game, and you plan ahead to use your cards or your items to be able to hit that monster the next turn, and then the world shift comes, and all of a sudden that monster's over there, you know, that's frustrating. That's frustrating. And I think uh, it's, it's when something is frustrating because it's built into the rules, 
that is a problem for me. And I think ultimately that was one of the things about the game that, that has left me feeling, feeling a little bit cold toward it, even though the game itself is very warm and the, not just from the colors, but even the, the backstories of the characters, the fact that you're given scenarios that develop their stories or are meant to help you play out their individual strengths and resource management, all that is great. And I really applaud the effort to do that and to do something different because we don't really see that so much. Again, the artwork is just absolutely stellar. The other thing that I feel, you know, again, it's just antithetical in a way. You have these beautifully designed areas of the world, yet the individual tiles, it's just, there's no terrain or anything. You just move one, two, three around, no matter what it is. And all, now I should say, I haven't seen every card. So perhaps there's an event card that impacts things. I'll put that as a caveat, but as far as the basic rules are concerned, and I should say also, there's another side, if this is too much, there's another side to each of the areas. So you can play with it at a more muted palette having spending so much effort to design these but yet having each area feel somewhat similar is another it's just it's a curious choice in the game and it, it just it feels like conflicted like the game isn't sure which way to go on that or the designers weren't sure which way to go on that and to swing back to something i said a couple times i would get to the notion that the game could be played as co-op, it could be played with a solo character, and it could also be played competitively, which I did not do. That too feels just a little bit unsettled to me. And at the beginning of the rule book, it states, it states Champions of Hera faces two distinct game modes versus arena, that's PvP, and scenarios, which are co-op. It is recommended that new players learn the game by playing the introductory version of the versus arena first before moving on to a full game and the more complicated scenarios. And it explains that the standard PvP contestants will go head-to-head -head in a race to be the first to gather 10 each of the three energy types. That's the uh, victory condition there, and then there are 18 different scenarios in the back of the book, and then within those scenarios, as I showed you earlier, some are meant to be indicative of the solo, meaning the single character, using their own specific rules and benefits, and then some are meant to be with multiple players using a either recommended or not recommended corrupted. And this is an example of one of the corrupteds. It, 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 on the one hand, that's a lot of choice. On the other hand, again, the scenarios, they feel somewhat similar ultimately when you play them. And I obviously have, or not obviously, but I have not played all 18. So I can't say that, but I've played enough with the different characters to, to say, at least from my perspective, it feels somewhat, they feel somewhat similar. So again, it's just, it's another kind of confusing or just inconsistent, maybe, inconsistent and at times confusing direction for the game. And it, it just, again, it almost, it almost feels like there were a lot of different ideas put forward in the game. And instead of picking and going in a, you know, strict direction that all of them and there are probably many more ideas than made it into the game, but that a, a many, many of them went into the game. And it's, it's hard to know because for design here, we have, we have um, just as we look at the credits here, design development, the illustration, again, just incredibly great. The minis are great. The, um, and some Kickstarter, this, I guess this was a Kickstarter game. It offers, it offers a lot. I see why it was recommended as a something, you know, when I noticed I hadn't been playing Mage Knight, I adore the art direction. Like other games that I've mentioned of late, Dark Venture being one, Dungeon Degenerates being another, the art direction here makes this stand out. It just truly does. And you might say, well, that's different than the mechanics, but the mechanics are solid as well. The, the card play is tight. The 
concepts behind it all work together uh, thematically to, that having a, a dream world and the world changing works together it's just in the kind of details where when you have such a mechanic of the card play that requires planning ahead and then you also have a situation where the tiles completely change. It just, it feels, that feels frustrating. That felt frustrating to me. Also such care to make these kind of worlds different, yet they didn't really feel super different to me. That's just, more, it's not frustrating, it's just a little curious. So, the, um, you know, the asymmetrical resource management of the characters is, is great. And the, as I said earlier, the making use of the small number of keywords for the monsters is also superb and really works well to provide enough, you know, that's some of the tactical part because you know the keyword's right there, you know how to plan for the attack, but then of course if you try to do your attack and the monster's gone, it's frustrating. Well, I've said that enough. In any case, that is my look inside of Champions of Horror and an enjoyable experience and yet again, just another game that highlights the staleness, I think, of the fantasy genre vis-a-vis -vis art direction and in that sense absolutely stands out.